Look Ruxton was an Indian-born British physician convicted and subsequently hanged for the September 1935 murders of his common-law wife, Isabella Ruxton, and the family housemaid, Mary Jane Rogerson, at his home in Lancaster, England. These murders are informally known as the Bodies Under the Bridge and the Jigsaw Murders, while Ruxton himself became known as the Savage Surgeon. The case became known as the Bodies Under the Bridge due to the location, near the Dumfrieshire town of Moffat in the southern uplands of Scotland, where the bodies were found. The case was also called the Jigsaw Murders because of the painstaking efforts to reassemble and identify the victims and then determine the place of their murder. Ruxton earned the title of the Savage Surgeon due to his occupation and the extensive mutilation he inflicted upon his victims' bodies. The prosecution of Ruxton's murders would prove to be one of the United Kingdom's most publicized legal cases of the 1930s. The case itself is primarily remembered for the innovative forensic techniques employed to identify the victims and prove that their murders had been committed within the Ruxton household. Buck Ruxton was born in Bombay, India on March 21, 1899. He was born into a wealthy middle-class Parsi family of Indian-French origin. Ruxton received a respectable upbringing, and despite being a sensitive youth with few friends, he was highly intelligent and received a thorough education. By his teenage years, he had resolved to seek a career in medicine. With the financial support of his parents, he studied at the University of Bombay, where he qualified as a Bachelor of Medicine in 1922. The following year, he qualified as a Bachelor of Surgery at the same institute. Shortly after completing his studies, Ruxton obtained employment at a Bombay hospital, where he specialized in medicine, midwifery, and gynecology. He would later gain employment with the Indian Medical Service, for which he would be deployed to Basra and, later, Baghdad. In May 1925, Ruxton married a Parsi woman named Motabai Jahangirji Ghadiali. The marriage was an arranged one, which ultimately turned out to be short-lived. When Ruxton relocated to Britain the following year, he concealed all evidence of this marriage, although in 1928, he did contact his father-in-law, Jahangirji, requesting he immediately sent him the sum of £200 via telegraphic transfer. With financial assistance from his family and the Bombay Medical Service, Ruxton relocated to Britain in 1926. He attended medical courses at London's University College Hospital under the name Gabriel Hakim, before moving to Edinburgh in 1927 to begin studies towards obtaining a fellowship of the Royal Colleges of Surgeons. Although Ruxton failed his entrance examination, the General Medical Council authorized his practicing medicine in the United Kingdom on the strength of the qualifications he had earlier obtained in Bombay. Shortly thereafter, he legally changed his name via deed poll to Buck Ruxton. While studying to become a fellow of the Royal Colleges of Surgeons in Edinburgh, Ruxton became acquainted with a 26-year-old 10, woman named Isabella Van S., who managed a cafe in the city. At the time of their acquaintance, Isabella was still legally married to a Dutchman whom she had wed in 1919, but this marriage had only lasted a matter of weeks, and she had resumed using her maiden name of Kerr. The two began courting, and when Ruxton relocated to England in 1928, he was in the company of Isabella. He worked as a locum to a London doctor, a fellow Parsi doctor named Manik Motofram, and later as an assistant to a Dr. B. R. Rygate. The following year, Isabella gave birth to the couple's first child, a daughter named Elizabeth. In 1930 the Ruxtons relocated from London to Lancaster, Lancashire, where he established a medical practice at his family home at 2 Dalton Square. Ruxton had made great efforts to assimilate himself into British society, and he quickly acquired a reputation among his patients as a diligent and compassionate general physician who was well respected and popular within the community. He is known to have waived his treatment fees on several occasions when he felt his patients could not afford to pay them. The following year, a second daughter, Diane, was born. Two years later, in 1933, Isabella gave birth to a son named William. The same year, the Ruxtons employed a young maid and live-in housekeeper named Mary Jane Rogerson, primarily to care for their children. Despite his esteemed reputation within the Lancaster community, the relationship between Buck and Isabella Ruxton was fraught, and he became increasingly suspicious of Isabella's alleged infidelity, reportedly exploding into fits of rage or bouts of tearful hysteria and self-pity behind closed doors. On several occasions, these arguments would prompt Isabella to pack her belongings and return to Edinburgh with her children, although inevitable phone calls from Ruxton in which he would tearfully plead with Isabella to return to Lancaster would prompt her to return to him and he would later state to investigators that on the frequent occasions Isabella would return to Dalton Square, she would almost invariably say to him, I wonder how I could ever pick up an argument with you. 2 Dalton Square, Lancaster 
Ruxton established both his medical practice and his family home at this address in 1930. It is unknown just when Ruxton began to accuse Isabella of adultery and assault her, although loud quarrels between the couple had resulted in police interventions on several occasions. The disputes between the couple occasionally had to be settled at the Lancaster Police Station, where police would observe Ruxton talking erratically before bursting into tears. Furthermore, Isabella is known to have attempted suicide by inert gas asphyxiation in 1932, and this suicide attempt had resulted in her suffering a miscarriage. On one occasion in 1933 Isabella complained to police that her husband had begun beating her. When police visited Ruxton's practice to investigate her claims, Ruxton denied he had assaulted his wife, alleging that Isabella had been unfaithful to him. Nonetheless, within 24 hours of this incident, Isabella had returned to her partner. On another occasion in April 1934 a Lancaster policeman had been called to the Ruxton household following another quarrel. Upon his arrival, the officer was informed by Ruxton, Sergeant, I feel like murdering two persons, my wife is going out to meet a man. In early September 1935 Isabella Ruxton traveled to Edinburgh to visit one of her sisters. In her company were a prominent Lancaster family named Edmondson, with whom the Ruxtons were closely acquainted. To tend to the needs of his practice, Ruxton himself did not accompany his common-law wife on this trip, and thus remained in Lancaster. He would later confess to investigators that he had been convinced that as Isabella had been known to occasionally keep social company with a young man named Robert Edmondson an assistant editor in the local town hall, she had been conducting an affair with him, and thus had used this trip as a means for the pair to continue their supposed affair. 28. Hotel records would later confirm each adult had booked into separate rooms while they had stayed in Edinburgh. On the evening of September 14, 1935 Isabella Ruxton left the family home to view the Blackpool illuminations and visit two of her sisters. She left Blackpool to return home at approximately 11.30 p.m. Upon her return to Dalton Square in the early hours of Sunday 15 September, Ruxton's jealousy and paranoia apparently overwhelmed him, and he most likely strangled Isabella into submissiveness, unconsciousness, or death with his bare hands, before beating and stabbing her body either to prevent their housemaid from discovering his crime or because she had actually witnessed the act, Ruxton extensively bludgeoned and either strangled or asphyxiated Mary Jane Rogerson. He probably also stabbed her body either before or after death. The amount of blood subsequently discovered on the stairs, walls, and carpeting of the Ruxton household indicates excessive blood flow prior to the body's mutilation, leading to the conclusion that Ruxton had stabbed either or both of the victims extensively shortly before or after death, or during the actual act of murder. On the day prior to the murders, Ruxton informed one of the two charwomen he and Isabella employed not to come to his premises until Monday 16th of September, within hours of the murders he had visited the home of the other charwoman he employed and likewise told her not to clean his premises until 16 September, explaining that Isabella and Mary Jane had traveled to Edinburgh. After he had driven his children to the home of a Morecambe dentist with whom he and Isabella had formed a close friendship and asked the couple to look after his children for the day, he returned to his home and proceeded to extensively dismember and mutilate both bodies in the bathroom of his home in an effort to hide their identities. Several hours later, at approximately 4.30 p.m., Ruxton visited the home of one of his patients, a Mrs. Hampshire, and asked both her and, shortly thereafter, her husband to return to Dalton Square with him to help him prepare for the decorators, who were expected to arrive the following morning to perform work he claimed had been arranged several months previously. When Mrs. Hampshire arrived at Dalton Square, she found the house in a state of disarray. As she would later testify at Ruxton's trial, all the carpeting had been removed from the stairs, and several sections of the flooring were littered with straw, which also protruded from beneath the locked bedroom door. Moreover, in the waiting room of the property, Mrs. Hampshire discovered several rolled-up sections of carpeting, stair pads, and a stained suit. In the garden of the property, Mrs. Hampshire also discovered two further sections of carpeting, and several burn towels. Before the Hampshires left Dalton Square, they were given several sections of stained stair carpeting and Ruxton stained suit to keep, upon the condition they thoroughly cleaned them. On the morning of September 29, 1935 a young woman named Susan Haynes Johnson glanced over the parapet of an old stone bridge located two miles north of the Dumfrieshire town of Moffat. Upon the banks of the stream, named Garden Home Lynn, which ran beneath the bridge, Johnson noted a bundle wrapped in fabric that had lodged against a boulder, with a partially decomposed human arm protruding from the package. Police from the Dumfrieshire Constabulary were called to the scene. Discovering the remains within the package were human, officers searched the stream, surrounding ravines, and the nearby Annan River, discovering two human heads, and four further bundles, 
each containing extensively mutilated human remains including thigh bones, legs, sections of flesh, and a human torso and pelvis. These human remains were in an advanced state of decomposition, and had been wrapped in bed sheets, a pillowcase, children's clothing, and several newspapers. Of the four bundles recovered during the initial search, the first was wrapped in a blouse and contained two upper arms and four pieces of flesh, the second bundle comprised two thigh bones, two legs from which most flesh had been stripped, and nine pieces of flesh, all wrapped in a pillowcase, the third was a piece of cotton sheeting containing seventeen portions of flesh, the fourth parcel, also wrapped in cotton sheeting, consisted of a human trunk, two legs with the feet tied with the hem of a cotton sheet and some wisps of straw and cotton wool. In addition, other packages opened to reveal two heads, one of which was wrapped in a child's rompers, a quantity of cotton wool and sections from the Daily Herald of August 6, 1935, two forearms with hands attached but minus the top joints of the fingers and thumbs, and several pieces of skin and flesh. One part was wrapped in the Sunday graphic dated 15th of September. Professor John Glaster Jr.'s inventory of the discoveries in and around the Garden Home Lynn Stream at Annan River, October 1, 1935. On 1st of October the remains were examined at Moffat Mortuary by the forensic scientist John Glaster Jr. and a doctor named Gilbert Miller. Both men determined the 70 separate sections of human remains thus far discovered were those of two females of notably different heights and ages, and that the mutilation conducted upon the remains had been committed by an individual with extensive anatomical knowledge in an obvious effort to complicate the identification of the remains. In addition to the extensive mutilation across both victims' entire bodies, which both Professor Glaster and Dr. Miller deduced had been entirely committed with a surgical knife as opposed to either a saw or an axe, the murderer had removed the eyes, ears, skin, lips, soft tissue, and several teeth from both heads to make identification via dental records or composite drawings impossible, with additional attention being devoted to areas of the body where possible distinguishing features such as operational scars or vaccinations may have been visible. The perpetrator had also removed the fingertips from the sole set of hands initially discovered, and had completely pared all flesh from the legs of one victim, and from the thighs of the other. Glaster also noted in his autopsy reports that had the perpetrator actually thrown the remains into the nearby Annan River as opposed to the tributary River Lynn, the bundles would likely have flowed into the Solway Firth, thus delaying or permanently preventing their discovery. Given the proximity of the Garden Home Lynn stream to such a major arterial road, detectives from Glasgow said, who had already established the remains were unlikely to be those of local individuals, began to consider the possibility the perpetrator had traveled to the southern uplands to dispose of the remains, and may have been unfamiliar with the area. On the evening of 12th of October Ruxton was arrested by Lancaster police and extensively questioned throughout the night. When asked to account for his whereabouts between 14 and 29 September, Ruxton produced a handwritten document entitled My Movements, which he then passed to investigators before making a voluntary statement based on what he had written. He then acquiesced to the investigator's interview. In this interview, Ruxton denied he had ever been to Scotland after having established his Lancaster practice. However, he was unable to explain just why his car registration number had been logged by a young cyclist whom he had knocked over in the Cumbrian town of Kendall on 17th of September, which had led to his vehicle being intercepted in nearby Milnthorpe the same day, as the cyclist had reported his registration number which he had logged in his pocketbook, to police when he had failed to stop at the scene of the accident. Lancaster police suggested to Ruxton this incident was strong circumstantial evidence as the incident had occurred as he had been driving en route to Lancaster from Moffat, which he denied. He was further unable to explain just why a police search of his home the previous day had revealed extensive traces of bloodstains on the stairs, railings, balustrade, and various carpets within the property despite evidence of the house being extensively cleaned, and several walls around the staircase being recently redecorated. Moreover, he was also unable to explain why traces of human fat and body tissue had been discovered within the drains of the property, with much of this material recovered within the section of the drains leading directly from the bathroom. Listen carefully to me. I intend to prefer a very serious charge against you. You are charged that between 14 and September 29, 1935 you did feloniously, and with malice aforethought, kill one Mary Jane Rogerson. Lancaster Chief Constable Henry J. Vaughn formally charging Buck Ruxton with the murder of Mary Jane Rogerson. October 13, 1935. Throughout the several hours of questioning, Lancaster police repeatedly conversed with their Scottish counterparts, who had previously visited Ruxton's household to remove objects such as sections of wallpaper, carpeting, skirting boards, and silverware for a more detailed forensic examination at Glasgow University. In the early hours of 13 October, 
The finger and palm prints upon the second set of human hands discovered were found to be a match for impressions upon items Mary Jane Rogerson had habitually handled at Dalton Square. Upon hearing of this forensic match, Ruxton was formally charged with the murder of Mary Jane Rogerson at 7.20 a.m. that morning. When Ruxton heard the recitation of the charge, he stated, most emphatically not. Of course not. The farthest thing from my mind. What motive and why? What are you talking about? Following an appearance in custody of the borough of Lancaster Police Court, situated on the ground floor of Lancaster Town Hall, Ruxton was remanded in custody. On 5th of November he was further charged with the murder of his wife, whose remains were positively identified using the technique of forensic anthropology, in which an X-ray of a victim's skull was superimposed on a photograph taken of Isabella Ruxton in life. Professor James Coor Brash would later construct replica models of the two victims' left feet and a flexible gelatin glycerin mixture, when placed in shoes the women had worn in life, the replica foot of the first victim recovered from the vicinity of the Annan River precisely fitted a shoe worn by Mary Jane Rogerson, whereas the replica foot of the second victim recovered precisely fitted shoes worn by Isabella Ruxton. On March 2, 1936 the trial of Buck Ruxton opened at Manchester's High Court of Justice. He was tried before Mr. Justice Singleton for the murder of Isabella Ruxton, and on this date chose to enter a formal plea of not guilty to the charge of murder. Following this formal plea, a jury was impaneled and sworn to duty. The prosecutors at Ruxton's trial, Joseph Cooksey Jackson K.C., David Maxwell Five K.C., and Harley Shawcross contended that Ruxton, inflamed by jealousy and paranoia, had murdered Isabella Ruxton and Mary Jane Rogerson in the family household, and that he had then discarded their bodies more than 100 miles from Lancaster, in the garden home Lynn Stream in the southern uplands of Scotland. In his opening speech to the jury, Joseph Cooksey Jackson stated to the jury, it does not need much imagination to suggest what probably happened in that house. It is very probable that Mary Jane Rogerson was a witness to the murder of Mrs. Ruxton, and that is why she met her death. You will hear that Mrs. Ruxton had received before her death violent blows in the face and that she was strangled. The suggestion of the prosecution is that her death and that of the girl Mary took place outside these rooms on the landing at the top of the staircase outside the maid's bedroom, because from that point down the staircase right into the bathroom there are trails of enormous quantities of blood. I suggest that when she went up to bed a violent quarrel took place, that he strangled his wife, and that Mary Jane Rogerson caught him in the act and had to die also. Mary's skull was fractured, she had some blows on the top of her head which would render her unconscious, and then was killed by some other means, probably a knife. Ruxton's defense counsel, Norman Burkett Casey, based their defense upon their contention that the bodies had been misidentified, and that the two bodies were not those of Isabella Ruxton and Mary Jane Rogerson but of two other unknown individuals, and that, as such, the evidence presented to the jury was flawed. Burkett and Kershaw further contended the bloodstains found upon the suit and carpeting Ruxton had given to the Hampshires, and located within his home following his arrest, had been innocently accrued throughout the years Ruxton had operated his practice. The prosecution called numerous witnesses to outline their case. Each witness to testify presented his findings to the court with the same patience and diligence he had used to determine his conclusions, and each was examined by a combination of Jackson, Shawcross and Fife. They would then be tirelessly cross-examined by either Burkett or Kershaw, who frequently seized on the slightest discrepancy in the evidence given, and frequently challenged assumptions made by medical and technical witnesses on each occasion an opportunity arose. Burkett also frequently offered his own conjecture as to how some evidence presented could have innocently accrued. For example, on one occasion, Burkett contended the blood found on the balustrade within 2 Dalton Square may have accidentally spilled there through either a birth, an abortion, or a woman's menstrual cycle occurring within the property. Despite both defense counsels subjecting the numerous eyewitnesses, and the medical and forensic experts whom the prosecution introduced as witnesses, to intense cross-examination in an effort to challenge their findings, the vast majority of prosecution witness, including all medical and forensic personnel to testify, remained steadfast as to his conclusions regarding the identification of the victims, and that their murders had been committed by Ruxton at 2 Dalton Square. Nonetheless, Ruxton's defense counsel did occasionally succeed in getting a witness or expert to concede as to a possibility of an alternative explanation as to his or her findings, or recollections. The sole witness to testify on behalf of the defense was Ruxton himself, who, upon the suggestion of his defense counsel, testified on the ninth day of the trial. Overall, he conducted himself poorly on the stand, being prone to bouts of hysterical sobbing as he clutched a silk handkerchief and hysterically claiming that he had last seen his wife when she had taken Mary Jane Rogerson to Edinburgh to discreetly arrange an abortion for her. 
he readily admitted to having frequently argued with his wife over her alleged infidelity, and justified the mental and physical hardships to which he had occasionally subjected his wife by simply stating, who loves most, chastises most. Despite this admission, Ruxton was insistent that both women would be found alive and further stated that if the actual identification of the bodies was correct, his happy home was now in tatters. He ardently denied the earlier testimony of various prosecution witnesses, whom he frequently accused of either lying or simply being mistaken, and frequently gave rambling, contradictory accounts of his own behavior and actions prior to his arrest when questioned by both his own defense counsel and when subjected to cross-examination by the prosecution. The trial of Buck Ruxton lasted 11 days, with the majority of the testimony delivered being from eyewitnesses and from medical and forensic experts who testified on behalf of the prosecution. In his closing argument delivered on behalf of the prosecution, Joseph Cooksey Jackson summarized the testimony delivered by each of the medical and forensic experts regarding the painstaking identification of the victims, and how items used to conceal the remains could be traced to Dalton Square, including a section of luxury sheeting wrapped around several sections of the bodies that had been proven to precisely match the sheeting from the bed in the master bedroom at Dalton Square. Outlining the inconsistencies in the accounts Ruxton had given to numerous individuals as to the whereabouts of his wife and maid, Jackson reminded the jury of the eyewitness testimony delivered by numerous individuals who had earlier testified, before turning to Ruxton's exhaustive efforts to destroy evidence and pacify Mary Jane Rogerson's parents as to their daughter's whereabouts in the weeks between the murders and his arrest. In reference to the actual motive for the murders, Jackson suggested the jury look no further than Ruxton's obsessive jealousy and violent temper. In accordance with British legal tradition, Norman Burkett, having called his client to the stand, had entitled himself to make his closing argument on behalf of the defense after the prosecution address, as opposed to before the prosecution. In his closing argument delivered on March 13, 1936, Burkett reiterated the defense's case that, although the victims were indeed two women who had been murdered, the remains were not those of Isabella Ruxton and Mary Jane Rogerson, as the Crown had alleged they were, and that the idea that the motive for Isabella's death had been Ruxton's suspicions of his wife's infidelity was merely conjecture. Burkett further emphasized that, Although some of the testimony delivered had allowed the possibility the bodies may have been those of Ruxton's wife and family maid, that these conclusions been drawn in part from circumstantial evidence and that this evidence still did not prove Ruxton had been their actual murderer. Burkett then emphasized that in any British murder trial, the burden is not upon the defense to prove innocence, but rather on the Crown to prove guilt. Upon completion of both counsel's closing arguments, Mr. Justice Singleton delivered his final instructions to the jury. This address lasted for several hours, and in reference to all evidence and testimony which had been presented at the trial, Judge Singleton instructed the jury that Ruxton must be given the benefit of any reasonable doubt that may exist in their minds, adding, if there is an avenue, let him walk down it to freedom, but if there is not, he cannot. Following this final instruction from Mr. Justice Singleton, the jury retired to consider their verdict. Following the closing arguments and Judge Singleton's final instructions, the jury retired to consider their verdict they would deliberate for just over one hour before returning a verdict of guilty against Ruxton. Consequently, Mr. Justice Singleton sentenced Ruxton to death. When asked by Judge Singleton if he had anything to say in response to the verdict and sentence, Ruxton responded by stating, I am very sorry, before politely thanking the court for its patience and the fairness of his trial. Ruxton then informed the judge of his intentions to appeal the verdict. Ruxton did file an appeal against his conviction. In this appeal, Ruxton contended that in the judge's final instructions delivered to the jury, the jury had been urged to consider prosecution testimony pertaining to bloodstains found upon the suit Ruxton had given to the Hampshires which had been introduced as evidence, but that he had not instructed the jury to also consider the testimony also delivered by a prosecution witness who had conceded that the bloodstains upon the garment may have originated from completely innocent sources. Furthermore, the appeal stated that a forensic examination of his vehicle, contended by the prosecution to have been the vehicle used to transport the bodies, had revealed no traces of either mud or blood. Ruxton thus contended that the cumulative effect of all matters raised were tantamount to a substantial misdirection. As such, Ruxton contended the verdict should not be allowed to stand. This appeal was heard at the Court of Criminal Appeal by then Lord Chief Justice Lord Hewitt, Mr. Justice Dupark, and Mr. Justice Goddard on April 27, 1936. The appeal was dismissed that same day as being insufficient as to even remotely suggesting any form of misdirection on the part of the judge at trial. In the hours immediately prior to his execution, Buck Ruxton wrote a letter to his chief defense counsel, Norman Burkett K.C. In this letter, Ruxton thanked Burkett for the skill in which he had conducted his defense, before stating, 
I know that in a few hours I shall be going to meet my maker. But I say to you, sir, I am entirely innocent of this crime. Despite a petition from Lancaster residents urging clemency for Ruxton having collected over 10,000 signatures, Ruxton was hanged at imprison Manchester on the morning of May 12, 1936. His executioner was Albert Pierrepoint. I killed Mrs. Ruxton in a fit of temper because I thought she had been with a man. I was mad at the time. Mary Jane Rogerson was present at the time. I had to kill her. The day after Ruxton's execution, a Sunday newspaper published a brief handwritten confession, written by Ruxton the day after his arrest, and which he had instructed be opened only in the event of his execution, or returned to him should he be acquitted. In this confession, Ruxton admitted to killing his wife while in a state of jealous fury, only to be interrupted in the act by Mary Jane Rogerson as a result of which he had to kill her. Despite intense police searches, the torso of Mary Jane Rogerson was never found, having likely flowed into the Solway Firth. The remains of her body actually recovered were buried in a churchyard in the village of Overton. The area in and around Gardenholm Lynn where Ruxton had disposed of the dismembered body parts of Isabella Ruxton and Mary Jane Rogerson would become colloquially known in and around Moffat as Ruxton's dump. The house on Dalton Square where the murders were committed would remain empty for decades. In the 1980s the building underwent substantial internal renovation, particularly the bathroom, which would become architects' offices. The building itself remains non-residential. The bath in which Buck Ruxton dismembered his two victims was removed from the property to be used as evidence during his trial. Afterwards, it was used as a horse trough by the Mounted Police Division at Lancashire County Police Headquarters, in the civil parish of Hutton, Lancashire. Elizabeth, Diane and William Ruxton are believed to have been brought up in an orphanage in the Wirral.